Everybody, how you doing? Mark Ross, ITK Radio. It's Monday. What is it? May 22nd. Oh, my gosh. It's almost the end of May. Coming up on Memorial Day weekend, which is exciting. Joining us today, Kevin Madden. Kevin, how's it going? Great. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited for Memorial Day weekend. I could use some a couple days off. It's <laughs> summer, man. It's unbelievable. It's officially it summer. Feel like that already. Like, the traffic was a little slower today, and everybody feels like um, – you're getting a lot of emails or calls saying, well, let's catch up again after the holiday, you know? So, <laughs> I like it. Good vibe. Thursday will be, uh, yeah, will be the best day. Um, so we're, we're finding you in D.C., right? I am, yeah. Here in our office, downtown D.C., uh, Penta offices, um, a couple blocks from the White House. So you grew up in New York, but you've been in D.C. now for – a few moved. decades, right? Yeah, I moved. Uh, yeah, so 23 years. I moved to Washington, just uh, Washington, D.C., right before the millennium. So, like, December 1999. Do you um, consider yourself a local? I do. I very much consider myself a Washingtonian now. It's interesting. I um, born and raised in New York. I went back to New York uh, for work this week. And uh, <laughs> it does. I feel sort of out of place. I feel like... Um, uh, you know, like it's gotten a little bit too faster, a lot louder than I remember it. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I, I want, I was like, I'm looking forward to getting back home. Right. And I always used to call New York home and now I'm calling Washington home. So I've been, yeah, I've been here. I've been in. Yes. Yeah, uh, but I, but I still do recognize that Washington can be a bubble and you really do have to get out of it uh, regularly. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I've been here. Yeah. A little bit, I guess since 96. So, and I've, I lived a few years in California, but I've lived longer in Virginia, DC than anywhere else. Um, I guess the weird thing though, I still have the allegiance for the Detroit Tigers and the uh, wonderful Detroit Lions. So I guess that keeps me uh, connected back to Michigan, yeah, which is right. good. So let's jump into it. You've had a very, uh, I, one of the more, I'd say illustrious communication careers. You've done everything from Capitol Hill, presidential campaigns, you worked in administration, you know, you're leading this dynamic communication firm now. I want to talk about um, Capitol Hill, namely the House of Representatives. I have a huge fondness for the House of Representatives, two-year cycles, a uh, huge mashup of uh, 435 distinct personalities and voices. What was your experience on Capitol Hill? What should we know about Capitol Hill? Well, I loved Capitol Hill. Um, funny thing about Capitol Hill is if you, if, you, if, you're, if you do it when you're younger, like at the right age, like in your, in your mid-20s, it's oftentimes like an extension of everything that you loved about college, um, but you're getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I think the thing, it's a very different era now. So I, I, I expect my experience might be different from the folks that are experiencing it right now. But the thing that was very apparent to me when I was there was just how consequential the work that we were doing um, was. Uh, and um, also the, just the level of professionalism when, I, when, I, when it comes to talent and drive and um, uh, really investment in the vocational aspect of politics and policy uh, that uh, was exhibited by the folks that I worked with. I, I had, so I started working up there probably 2001 and through all the years I was working up there, um, I still have relationships with the people that I worked with there that are, are just strong and the basis for a lot of the work that I do now, even today. So you're thinking about uh, a job that allows you to draw on the experience and, and relationships from 20 years ago. That's a pretty good indication of, um, of the value, I think that that station in life and station in my profession, um, uh, really, really, what it contributed to my to my overall sense of uh, value as a profession. Yeah, I do. I love the your uh, yeah the comment about just the amount of talent or you know how serious it is. I mean, um, I always joke like every high school class president somehow ends up in Washington D.C. and the amount of talent or just being exposed to different people from obviously from around the country and the hot house nature of the house is interesting because you are reading stuff on the front page but you're also in these discussions kind of shaping strategy and building coalitions talk about um the media coverage if you will on capitol hill i guess with the transformation you've seen over the last 20 years yeah it's changed dramatically but 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 by the way to your point i think that was a unique time in the early 2000s where after uh, after 9 11 a lot of people felt a real pull to sort of service and a pull to towards washington so you had folks from all different walks of life deciding to come down and work on Capitol Hill or work in Washington, that nowadays I think the pull to like Silicon Valley or to banking or startups is much stronger. So you're not getting the same level of attention from some really uh, top professionals. Not that it's a bad thing, but it's certainly a phenomenon. 
Um, the uh, media environment, gosh, it's so different from uh, back then. We uh, n- nowadays, you know, the like if you're working in leadership up, up on Capitol Hill where I worked, I worked in the majority for two majority leaders, majority leader Tom DeLay and then majority leader John Boehner. Um, when I was working in those offices, we didn't have to deal with the mobility of information and the um, the the way that uh uh, social media has really changed the construct of of um, uh, information sharing, and then also the power dynamic up on Capitol Hill. Um, largely, you got known <laughs> and noticed by law, by by media on Capitol Hill, and the media back then was the Washington Post, Roll Call, you know, maybe the Hill, National Journal, Congress Daily, um, the folks that covered watch, uh, the the institution of Congress on a day to day, minute by minute basis. Uh, now, um, that's very different because with one tweet or with one YouTube video or one, you know, handheld um, message uh, into your iPhone that can be then uh, platformed across things like Facebook or any other social platforms, any member of Congress has as much access to the media cycle uh, as anybody in leadership. Uh, so it's just a very different, much um, um, more chaotic process of of both promoting information and then managing information flows up on capitol hill than it was when i worked there yeah the ability for uh yeah a congressperson from anywhere in the country now to raise their profile and go directly to the idea you know idea marketplace is interesting i think yeah i would think back in the aughts you know, the House conference, the leadership would kind of think around, like, who should we get to be the spokesperson this week, right? <laughs> Who's right. the best person to talk about this message? Now, any member of Congress can self-appoint themselves and kind of skip leadership yeah. and go directly to producers and to the audience. The concentration of information in the leadership structure, as well as leadership staff, was so much greater than now. In many ways, look, you can argue that it's been democratized, right? Um, when I used to walk into the speaker's lobby, uh, I, reporters used to flock to talk to me because they wanted to know about the schedule, what I knew about the different negotiations that were taking place with with, with big pieces of legislation that were moving. Now, um, any staffer who has that information that can tweet it <laughs> or a member of Congress that is, uh, you know, very active on social media, like a Marjorie Taylor Greene or somebody else, they, they get a tremendous amount of attention from the Capitol Hill press corps. So, in many ways, it's been um, it's been the information uh, structure has been flattened and democratized as a result. Pivoting to your experience uh, working at the Department of Justice, and I'm just curious from like administration communications and like this idea of like no drama, Obama. Um, it even seems like the Biden team, Biden, there aren't a lot of leakers per se, unlike uh, the Trump White House, where there seem to be a lot of people talking. Um, can you just talk about message discipline? writ large in administration the visa, the house just seems like anybody's there's a, like a lot more free agents you know you're a member of congress you're elected by people whereas the administration huge organization and how you keep that kind of message dip- discipline with all kinds of different personalities and agencies yeah well i think message discipline comes from recognizing just like the fast pace of the news cycle now we are not in a 24 hour news cycle anymore we're in a 24 second news cycle seven days a week and um, because there's so many more platforms, because with a wealth of information, there's oftentimes a poverty of attention. Um, <laughs> you just have to think much more like an executive producer at a content machine than you do um, your, your, your traditional press secretary from the, from the 1990s working up on Capitol Hill, which is when the phone rings, I'll answer it, right? Uh, the, the communications director or anybody who's in charge of uh, message execution now has to think about how they program multi, many different platforms for um, across 24 uh, hour um, uh, increments. So you have to think of, you have to think like a, a lot more like a news producer. And then you also have to think about how do I deploy my talent, right? That in, in, a, in a news channel, you're worried about your talent and a um, message structure that's uh, built around a principal at the White House or a principal up on Capitol Hill. Uh, you have to think about it in terms of surrogates uh, and you have to think about it in terms of audiences uh, seg- that are being segmented. So um, that's a much um, different animal than it used to be. It's, the pace has gotten so much quicker. But uh, to your point about um, message discipline, I think that's where you you have the message discipline is in making sure that you're constantly developing content 
that is uh, focused on the themes or the messages of the day that you want to promote. Um, and then all how it's um, being programmed in the in that 24 second news cycle to all of these different to the all of these different audiences. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, one of my mantras is like, think like a journalist, like how would a journalist receive this? And I love that idea of like, yeah, you're almost an executive producer now. You're putting together the story, identifying the actors, the screenwriters. Um, it's a little bit more Hollywood. It's a little bit more the content production is really on your end. Let's talk about um, presidential campaigns. You worked on two of them. Um, first off, favorite diner in New Hampshire. I got to go. It's weird. I just saw I saw it this week with um, the Santos was there, the Red Arrow. In the Red Arrow. I know. Yeah, it's a safe one. Yeah, there's, the Red Arrow is good. There's one out near the airport, too, that's really good. My, my uh, campaign, um, uh, my really bad campaign diet was always uh, the one thing that I had a weakness <laughs> for was I love uh, French fries and gravy. I know that's like a very Baltimore thing. Um, I picked that up from watching the movie Diner when I was a kid. I, I was like, <laughs> the idea of French fries and gravy sounded so good to me. And there's an airport, I forget, there's a, a diner out near the airport, uh, Manchester, that is also really good, but I forget the name of it. But Red, I have to say Red Arrow, just because it's so it's so small, it, there's so many characters <laughs> in there, and they also have C-SPAN mugs. Like, if you go to, if you go to the uh, Red Arrow Diner, they have a Red Arrow C-SPAN mug, which I always thought was kind of funny. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, there's like, that's kind of the key, right? When you're on the trail, like knowing where the best spots are, the best food, you know, what the pit stops are between the truck stops in Iowa, all that good stuff. Yeah. But seriously, talking about, um, you had an amazing experience with Romney. You also did stuff with Bush Cheney. And I really, from a macro perspective, can you just talk about wrestling with how much time to spend on the campaign trail with the principal versus how much time being back in HQ vis-a-vis uh, -vis developing your team as well. Obviously, you have state, when you're running a national campaign, you also have states that have spokespeople. Um, can you just talk about it from a macro perspective, what, it, what it's like from the comm side of being on a presidential campaign? Well, I think uh, to put it in prior, to prioritize where I think has the most value, I think uh, time with the candidate, whether it's on the road or on the phone uh, or off the road when they're back in headquarters or even, you know, uh, wherever they are, uh, taking, taking time off the road, uh, taking time off the campaign trail. That's the most valuable time because the, what made me the most effective spokesperson and I think the most effective engineer of the campaign's message was really getting a deep understanding of how the candidate talked about issues, talked about their vision um, in, in, in downtime, really articulated what it is that they wanted the, can the campaign to reflect, the values that they wanted it to reflect, the the issue priorities and wanted to reflect. So just spending time with a candidate is the most important. Um, I think it's important though, to get out of the HQ and spend some time on the road for two reasons. First is you want to see how audiences are reacting. You want to be able to have, you know, a voter in Iowa or New Hampshire or Ohio or Florida, you know, one of these big battleground states in the general, sort of grab you by the elbow, like uncle Leo from Seinfeld and say, Hey, here's <laughs> what you guys need to know, you know? It's really great to hear what customers are saying about the product um, and hear it directly from them. Um, that's really important. The other part of it is, is really getting to know the reporters that are covering the campaign trail, not only the ones that are national, because they tend to get the bubble and they're sort of focused on the American idolization of campaigns, but instead sitting down with the reporter from the, from, um, the union leader in you know, Manchester, right? The Columbus right. Dispatch in Ohio, um, the St. Petersburg Times in Florida, really getting to learn what those because those folks are the best um, barometers for what's taking place in the um, in the states where it matters, and they know what's driving sort of the, the the mood in a particular state. And so, getting to learn to and talk to them, and knowing that you can pick up the phone and call them, and they can pick up the phone and call you, um, that's a trem of tremendous value for any campaign. Yeah, building those relationships or even sounds like obviously having even more than a relationship, that trust factor where, you know, you're gonna, you can have candid conversations. They're a reservoir of local knowledge, too. That's the most right. important thing is they're, they, they have a reservoir of local knowledge. They know who's up, who's down, what, why, and just being able to. And that's one of the most important things, I think, of any communicator is having conversations with reporters that, that where the pens are down on both sides, where it's like, hey, what are you hearing? What do you know? What's, uh, what's um, driving – the, um, the, the mood out in that uh, particular area. I remember in the 2004 campaign, 
uh, having a conversation like that really helped us tap into one of the un, un, unpollable stories, which was um, childhood hunger in some of the areas around uh, Columbus, uh, some of the areas around Ohio, not only Columbus, Ohio, but maybe further out into um, uh, the Appalachia area. And so having knowledge of that and being able to sort of maybe, you know, have that imported into some of our campaign messaging and some of our surrogate messaging and our campaign engagement was, I think, crucial to sort of winning that state in 2004. Yeah. yeah so talk about obviously you've worked for some, I don't know, I mean, big, pre, big personalities, big. There's obviously an ego, like if you're a majority leader, if you're right for president, you know, you've got some stature. Talk about how you build rapport with these high profile principles and how do you like ingest the story? Like, hey, uh, Mr. Romney, I heard this story. I think there's an angle here. Zanesville, Appalachia, Ohio. Let's talk about this on the next campaign stop. Can you just any insights you have on working with these high profile personalities and people, frankly, that are really driven at the top of their profession? Yeah, well, I think the main thing I wanted to do was let them uh, was really build a strong degree of trust that I had their back with their with their public profile. I mean, that's the one thing that they worry about. That you're essentially putting your name on a ballot, right? If you're a Romney or you're a Bush or you're a Boehner or a Delay, your name's on the ballot. Your name is um, is is um, the focal point of of the organizational messaging, and so. You want to make sure that they know that you have an understanding of the system uh, and that you have a plan to promote their vision, their values, um, their uh, their agenda. Um, and so that's one part of it. The other part is really listening. Um, I think the most important thing I did was ask my principals a lot of questions. What were their hopes for the campaign? What were their um, what were their aspirations for the party, the, the message, their their agenda? I really wanted to learn what drove them, what made them tick, uh, you know, what made them tick, right? Um, what was the, what were the main thoughts that they had every single time they got up every morning, put their two feet on the floor and started their day? Um, once I started to really learn that and get a sense for um, what, what drove their work, uh, I could then build the message and the campaign and the, the, the infrastructure around that. And then also serve as, a, sort of as a, be an ambassador not only to reporters, like, hey, this is what makes Romney tick every single day, right? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Him. Um, not only as ambassador to the reporters, but an ambassador to others in the campaign. Um, I had a relationship with the with the candidate that maybe some others and there were junior staff didn't enjoy, but I wanted to make sure that I articulated that so that they could do their job effectively every single day as well. Those are great insights. Um, I'm you. I'm curious. I just thought about this. Like you've been uh, an insurgent campaign, right? The Romney versus the Obama machine, and then you worked for an incumbent, right, with Bush. Can you just talk about the differences between the two campaigns in general? Just yeah. like if you were talking to like a layperson, just say, "Listen, this they're presidential campaigns, but they are different in the sense of like here, when you're the incumbent versus the insurgent." Uh, so here's the analogy that I've always used is when you work on a, a, on a re-election for an incumbent, it is like being on an ocean liner where you've got like one of those um, bracelets around for the all you can eat buffet. And, um, uh, but you're on that ocean liner. You can't really get off the pirates, uh, the, the incumbent uh, campaign, the insurgent camp, I'm sorry, the insurgent campaign where you're sort of like starting from nothing. That's like being on a pirate ship. And you don't necessarily know where it's going to go. Uh, and every once in a while, you're going to have to get off, do some pillaging, and then get back on. <laughs> and it's, uh, th th it's, it's very different. And the pirate ship can make sort of quick turns and changes, whereas an ocean liner, it takes a long time to turn around an ocean liner. Um, so there are advantages and disadvantages to both. But I would say that's the, uh, the analogy, I would say, for, uh, for how they're different. Yeah, even that, I love that analogy. It's like, yeah, there's one port of call. Like, it won't be surprised. Like, Bush did this. It wouldn't be surprising if Biden just did one campaign stop a day, right? Whereas whoever the GOP nominee is will probably be doing three or four and uh, <laughs> try to get as much attention as possible. When you were working on a you know, when we were working on 2004 campaign, I used to joke around the campaign manager was Ken Melman. We used to joke that it was like Ken Melman and Associates. Like it was like going to a, a, a firm every single day, and you had your tie on, your shirt on, and like, and you had a reporting structure, and it was very detailed. And it was we were con we were talking about KPIs and metrics, and you know our meeting schedule was very rigid, and our but our roles and responsibilities were very clear, and we knew what we had to do. When you work on uh, the insurgent campaign, like when Matt Rhodes and I first started out in two thousand. It was like early 2007 for the Romney 2008 campaign. 
it was me, him, and a couple of boxes and the real estate guy letting us in to 585, which was this empty cavernous place. And like, you know, it was, there was three of us. It was me, him, and the real estate guy, you know, who, who opened the door and said, here, this is your new campaign next year. <laughs> and, you know, it was very, very different. But now the, that campaign grew into like 125 people within, you know, four to five months and had 25 million in the bank. So it was like working at a startup. So Melman and Associates versus like, you know, Rhodes and Madden startup like that was, uh, you know, um, that, that was a big it was a two different worlds. But I will tell you, they're, they're both fun. They're both interesting. You both you learn a lot on both. That was a great insights. Um, I want to we got a few more few minutes left. I want to talk a little bit about just the nature of media today. Cable news. Um, I, there's a great today. Ben White, I don't know if you saw this, Ben White from Politico is joining the Messenger, which is a new you know media startup. But it was released by Semaphore, and I was just like, what a world we're living in. You know, like this, <laughs> all these like new media startups. Uh, you know, there's such an appetite for news. Cable's going through this interesting situation, but the, in the news guys like CNBC and Bloomberg seem to be doing great. ESPN's trying to figure out what to do. Um, you're both a practitioner. You've been on air as, as a you know personality and an analyst, and obviously you're helping to shape and influence the news. Um, any thoughts on what's happening with the media? Do you know what's happening with the media? Well, um, I think it's become much more specialized, particularly with like Washington and uh, Washington as an industry and the different silos inside the Washington industry, whether it's you know tech policy or uh, finance uh, or healthcare, and um, you know there are audiences that um, want very specialized coverage. Um, they want it fast. They want it in real time. Um, I think Axios has sort of captured it um, uh, pretty accurately with their uh, what they call smart brevity, right? Um, and um, I think that's um, that model um, where you know. Jake Palmer, or, or sorry, uh, uh, you know, Jake Sherman and Anna Palmer are in your uh, iPhone every single morning with uh, <laughs> the most important news that happened overnight. And then as soon as you read that, they're right back at, well, what you need to know that happened uh, this morning um, with their with their PM update. Like that model, I think, is um, very important. I think it's um, it's, it's driving the uh, the. Washington institution uh, when it comes to its appetite for news. And I think it's going to continue to be very successful because um, they have very unique sources and they also have a unique level of credibility about the plate, about the, um, the issues that they're covering. I think on the other side of it, there is a sort of more mass consumption part of it. And uh, that's largely um, where sort of cable news resides right now. And um, I think linear TV is having a harder and harder time um, finding um, an audience uh, beyond just the most de dedicated partisans. Um, and uh, I don't really have an answer for that. I think I read up about it and try to learn as much about it as possible. But um, more and more folks are sort of trying to settle into an area where they flip on take cable television and they kind of want to hear a bit of more of an echo chamber back at them than they do really want to get informed and decide what is it that – you know, get, get, get informed or decide sort of, um, of uh, the, how to uh, look at politics. Yeah. Well, television is having a little bit of a harder time with that. I know that that's kind of where I reside, right? Which is like when I go on television, I don't necessarily want to be the analyst that tries to fire up my base as much as I try to explain what's happening and why and how I think the landscape is going to shift over the next 48 to 72 hours based on my experience of having worked up on Capitol Hill and working campaigns. Yeah, I know. I appreciate your, yeah, the perspective is that being a uh, strategist as opposed just to, you know, raw partisan. It's pretty easy to, I mean, be a raw partisan, take cheap shots, you know, from either side. So sometimes stepping back and saying, here's what's really happening. Speaking of what's really happening, election 2024, I think we got a big week. Uh, it looks like everybody's going to jump in the pool. Um, based on your experience on campaigns, on cable TV, just what should we be looking for going into this? The early part of this, the campaign looks like we're officially starting yeah, the well, election 2024 campaign. 
So I have um, I have a rule. Uh, I have a couple of rules. I always call them Madden rules. They're not really formal. I sort of just uh, it's kind of a joking way of referring to it. But like one of my rules, as you know, is uh, it's in my Twitter profile. Hope is not a strategy, right? Like you have right. to have I love, great, which I love, which is you have great. to have yep. a really detailed plan <laughs> on what it is that you want to do and why. But one of the other ones is expedite the inevitable. And so one of the things I think these campaigns have to recognize is that there is no path around Donald Trump in the Republican primary that you can only go out and take this nomination. And because he's seen as the incumbent, you have to sort of take it from him. And if you don't do that now, and you and if, or if, say, say you're successful and you win, even in a, in a general election, there's a, there's almost a 0, 0.0 chance that Donald Trump goes away and that you're ultimately going to be facing him even for, as, as the outside if you win that. So my, well, the one thing I'm going to be looking for is what campaign really recognizes that their campaign has to confront Donald Trump at some point and that they have to make the case for a better, smarter, uh, more advanced vision for the party than Donald Trump. Like they have to distinguish themselves from Trump versus thinking that they can sort of dance around him and maybe somebody else will do their do the dirty work for them and the nomination will fall to them. I don't believe that. And I think the campaign that that's going to ultimately win this is the campaign that recognizes that um, that they have to go out and, and get the nomination versus having it fall to them. And I, that's the one thing I want to see. Is it DeSantis? Is it Rick Scott? Right now, it looks like Trump. Trump is like, this is my nomination. I'm going to go get it. I'm going to take it. It's mine. And you have to fight me for it. Um, and uh, it'll be interesting to see if one of these other campaigns sort of realizes the dynamics of this race and, um, and really goes out there and builds an aggressive, a really aggressive uh, campaign around their candidate. What's your thoughts on, uh, you know, Team Biden? Uh, Kamala Harris seems to be in an interesting position. You know, a lot of hand wringing on the left. A lot of like, what do we, you know, what do we do? How do we raise this profile? I, I mean, I, she is vice president, so you know, how do we deal with that? I don't know how Kamala. I don't know how uh, Kamala Harris figures into it as much as I think the principle is always the is always the focal point here. And the one problem that they have is, and this is not just shared by partisans, is even the people who are the most dedicated uh, uh, supporters of Biden worry about the age issue, worry about, um, you know, what does the candidate have what it takes to really take on uh, another rematch with Trump, right? And so that's a very real concern. And it's the one thing that you can't change, which is his age. He's not going to get any younger during this campaign. He's only going to get older. So it's a, I, I'd be wringing my hands on that side of it, too. I mean, if you look at his approval ratings, if you look at where people's right track, wrong track of viewpoints are right now. Um, there's concern. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. All right, as we wrap up, what are and we're going into the summer season. It can be anything. What are you reading and watching? Anything fun, frivolous? Any books I should stack away? I go uh, to the beach I'm, or? Uh... I'm thinking. I'm, re I'm right now. I'm reading a book I just started called Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. Um, oh yeah behavioral science and um its role in um in how people process information is really interesting it's it's a it's a hard read though it's like not for guys not for people if you're used to if you're used to like you know reading golf magazine like me it's uh, <laughs> it requires a sort of another level of uh intellectual discipline but it's pretty it's pretty interesting the other thing i'm watching is i watch a ton of um my boat i have i have three sons two of them are big baseball players the other one's a lacrosse player so i'm watching a lot of college baseball right now when we sort of relax on friday and saturday nights we kind of skip around the television and watch um, college baseball from all over the country um, but a lot of sec a lot of acc the teams that are around this region virginia tech um, you know, go down to Wake Forest, UVA right now. They're all playing really great baseball. And uh, college baseball, it's just, uh, I think it's a real pure form of the uh, sport right now. It's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, no, I totally agree. I, I've actually caught a few games at the Naval Academy, and they've got a great little stadium. And, you know, you're sitting there on a beautiful campus. And I was down in Charlottesville a few weeks ago, and same thing. I mean, the UVA baseball stadium, yeah, it probably sits like 5,000 people. But, you know, you're in this right, beautiful right. surrounding, and you're like, this it's is great. Right. They, so. they, draw a lot, they draw a lot of fans. Yeah, I mean, you go down to places. Uh, you go down to like Vanderbilt on a Friday, Saturday night. That's that's the ticket. Uh, if you if you don't have a ticket to the Grand Old Opera, you're going to watch you know, people, uh, play uh, play another team from the SEC, and it's really great baseball, and it's a really great environment. I haven't been to one of those games down there yet, but my oldest son is getting ready to do some college visits, so I'm looking forward to uh, making the uh, making the tour down there, uh, see some of these stadiums, maybe catch a game while I'm visiting some campuses. 
No, I love it. Yeah, you gotta check. You gotta, you know, it's not just the dorms. You gotta check out the uh, sports facilities. Yeah, you know? right. The other thing too is college softball. I, I, if you want to watch um, like high scoring contests with really fantastic athletes, college softball is a is another really fun sport to watch on television. I love it. Well, this is good stuff, Kevin. Thanks for making the time. I enjoyed our conversation. This was good. I got some uh, good insights. Great to be with you. I appreciate it. All right. See ya. Yeah. Thanks, man.